All right. Welcome to the Little Falls Area Chamber of Commerce sponsored candidate forum for Senate. My name is Deborah Bowles. I'm the President and CEO of the Little Falls Area Chamber of Commerce that proudly serves all of Morrison County. And joining us today is incumbent Paul Gazilka and his challenger, Jason Weinerman. This is a forum, it's not a debate. The candidates are here to share with us why they feel they are the best person to represent us in the Senate, not to address their opponent's strengths or perceived shortcomings. Uh, the candidates received the questions in advance. A coin, was, a coin was tossed at the beginning to determine who would answer the first question first, and then the, the questions would rotate back and forth. And the coin toss was won by Paul Gazilka. The chamber wishes to remind the public that the views expressed here are those of the candidates and not those of the Area Chamber of Commerce. There is a four minute response time for each question. A timer will note when there is a 30 second time mark left for to answer the question. Um, when the timer has noted that time has lapsed, they will give us another sign, and Mary will show us that one. And at that point in time, we'd like you to complete your answer. If you do wish to rebut a comment made by your opponent, uh, single me, and we will give you 30 seconds to do that. So we'll start off today again with uh, Paul Gazilka, and we will do opening statements. So Paul, please give us uh, a short biography, why you are seeking re-election to the Senate, and what groups and organizations have endorsed you. Well, first of all, good morning. Uh, this is a, an interesting week for Jason and I. We have six uh, of these debates, which is pretty interesting. Uh, we do more than the presidents do, but um, or presidential candidates. But uh, a little bit about myself first. Uh, uh, I've been married to my wife for 34 years. Uh, we have five kids, age 30 all the way down to 15, uh, 30 down to 23, and then a surprise 15-year-old. But uh, makes life really interesting. And now we have three grand grandkids, so we're in a whole new phase of, of life, and I think that's helpful in, in bringing perspective on marriage and family and all the things related to that, education, and all the things that you have to do related to that. And uh, uh, my background is, is business. I've been a business owner for uh, uh, all of my life, right out of college, uh, and so I have an insurance agency up in the Brainerd Lakes area, uh, and that gives me perspective on what it takes to, to be a business owner, what it takes to create a job. Uh, how you actually have to pay for all the taxes and navigate through the regulations. And so down at the Capitol then, uh, those were some of the things that interested me. And so at the Capitol, uh, I've, I've served for eight years as a legislator. Uh, right now I serve on taxes, where I'm the lead Republican. Commerce, where I'm the lead Republican. Veter state government and veterans and rules, and I'm also a Republican assistant leader in the Senate side. And so uh, it, it takes a little time to get into those places, but uh, that's where I'm at now. And so those are some of the issues that I work on and why I'm running for office. Um, and what I would do if I was reelected is pass that tax bill or something very similar to it that the governor vetoed. We, we, we passed a bipartisan tax relief bill uh, that gave ag property tax relief, it gave relief to veterans, it gave relief on student loans, it gave relief to small business owners, it increased local government aid 20 million, county program aid 10 million. It was a very good bipartisan bill, uh, so good that you know, honestly both uh, DFL uh, chair of taxes of SCOI and myself both encourage the governor, please don't veto this bill. This is good for Minnesota. It's good for rural Minnesota. And uh, he vetoed it, and that was very disappointing. We're going to bring something right back like that, hopefully with more tax relief, because I will say the House Republicans in their tax bill had more than what we compromised on, and one of the big additions was uh, exemption of Social Security income. Uh, so that we're one of a five or six states that, that still tax Social Security, and we felt like that should be exempted as well. So that'll be the main thing I work on. 
one. Uh, the other thing is is Minsure. Uh, Minsure is a, a total failure. I think we should repeal it. That would be my first choice. If not repealing it, uh, certainly we have to fix it, and, and we could talk more about that later. Uh, and then finally, transportation. We have to have more money towards roads and bridges, and <coughs> that also was was not uh, was vetoed. But quickly, the groups that endorsed me, I'm endorsed by MCCL. That's the pro-life group. I'm endorsed by the NRA and GOCRA. Those are those that uh, protect the Second Amendment right. Uh, Farm Bureau for for ag, uh, NFIB, and the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce uh, endorsed me for businesses and, and more. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Jason, please give us your opening statement, the short biography, why you are seeking a seat at the Senate, and tell us what groups and organizations have endorsed you as well. Um, as Paul mentioned, thank you folks for all being here, and thank you for those who are going to watch this on the webcast or public access television later. Um, we have done three, four of these already. We've got three more to go, so if Paul doesn't complete one of his answers, I can do it for him, and he can probably do the <laughs> same for me. Um, so why am I running for office here? Well, a little bit of background on me. Um, I moved with my wife to Minnesota, to Little Falls, 10 years ago. Prior to coming to Minnesota, I lived across the Red River in North Dakota, a small town up in northeastern North Dakota, where the only radio station I got was either Canadian or Minnesota. Um, so I didn't know what was happening in North Dakota, but I had plenty of information about Canada and Minnesota. And one of the really interesting things is if you live in North Dakota and hear Minnesota radio, you often find yourself asking the question, why aren't we doing that here? Because Minnesota often tends to do things correctly. It's one of the things that we're known for nationwide. In Minnesota knows what to do, and we're willing to do the hard work to get things done. So um, I got tired of living in a state where they were not doing anything or doing things wrong and came to the place where they were doing things right. Moved out here uh, and moved for a job with the Board of Water and Soil Resources where during the day I work with local governments to maintain and improve the quality of our water and soil resources. Coming out here in 2006, um, much of the time I've been here, the state government has been dealing with recessions and deficits. And what we have done is we've done the responsible thing and trimmed our budgets um, on the state budget side. But unfortunately, many times when we trim the state budget, we've told our local partners, you folks can pick up the slack. Um, we don't want to raise income tax, but if you want to raise property tax to cover your retired service, to re your required services, great. That way your county commissioners, your township boards will get the heat, and we're free and clear from cutting our budgets. Um, that's put a lot of pain on our local governments, and it's also put pain on the citizens, both in terms of lesser services and increased property taxes. So that's one of the primary reasons I'm running um, for state office, is I understand what happens on the local government level. I often talk with county commissioners, conservation district folks, township folks, city folks, and they are screaming from the pain they've gotten from state cuts followed by increased mandates. So when we look at a civil society, it's a larger network of organizations and entities involved in making sure we have civil society. It's a partnership between the individuals, between businesses, between social community services and groups, local governments, the state government, and the federal government. Uh, in the past few years, we've seen less and less support from the federal government, and we need to go ahead and rebuild the state support. So that's one of the reasons I'm running, to enhance our state services and bring us back to where we used to be when people thought Minnesota was doing a really good job. Um, so that's the primary reason I'm running. Who am I endorsed by? I'm endorsed by many of the labor unions, so the working folks, uh, Minnesota Education Association, uh, the Association of Federal, State, and County Employees, um, Farmers Union, um, the Teamsters. I'm also um, proudly supported by Planned Parenthood. I am pro-choice. Um, and also um, some of the faculty organizations in the Minnesota colleges and university system. Okay, great. Thank you, Jason. And then as we rotate our questions, we will go back to Jason for question number two. 
As the chamber interacts with its members, a reoccurring theme of finding and keeping employees is heard at all skill levels from every industry. The companion piece to this is the seemingly endless government programs that make it undesirable to work when the government benefits are better than a paycheck. What is your response to this? So that is a, a, a big issue, is the finding and keeping employees. Um, so there are a lot of underemployed people in the community. And um, it's a mismatch between what's out there, the people who are employable and the jobs that are out there. We need to do more effort to help our local businesses cover that gap. One of the areas we've often looked at is many businesses rely on the state colleges and university system to provide the education and training for folks who are coming out of school and heading into the job force. And I've heard many complaints. Um, I teach college and I've heard from some businesses saying, why aren't our college students prepared to enter the job force? Um, and I think one of the things we need to do is reinvigorate the business side of that relationship to encourage businesses to do more actually on the job training. I'd like to explore the concept of an apprenticeship program where businesses can take on local kids, local jobs, um, and as you work in your apprenticeship program, we would provide a similar tax credit to serve as a sort of a tuition-based offset to help the businesses bring folks back onto board, get them on the training that they can be in your offices, in your workforces, um, doing the jobs you have, and understanding what the actual job you want is and be prepared on the machinery and equipment you have. Um, and also there's the, the, the question on um, government benefits serving paying too much to allow folks to go into the service, the labor industry. One of the challenges we do have is many of our benefits have a cliff. So you're supported up to a certain point, um, and then when you reach an income level, your benefits are cut off. So if you make a certain point, you are no longer eligible for benefits. And what that does is it creates a disincentive for folks to stay in the workforce. So yes, the benefits might be good enough once you reach a certain point, and then you're on your own, and you wind up falling behind the curve. I think as a state, we need to do a better job of tapering those benefits off so we provide the support for people and they're not cut off, and find the benefits, the loss of the benefits too difficult um, so that you don't have a job and you stay on the public roles. Okay, great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Paul, would you like the question restated? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, as the Chamber interacts with its members, a reoccurring theme of finding and keeping employees is heard at all skill levels from every industry. The companion piece to this is the seemingly endless government programs that make it undesirable to work when the government benefits are better than a paycheck. What is your response to this? So I'll take the uh, the welfare piece first. Um, we absolutely want to take care of, of the least fortunate and find paths for them to move from welfare to work. That is a critical direction that we need to have. Uh, but it can't be so beneficial that there's no desire to make the step to work, and, and that is a difficult thing. Uh, Jason and I do agree that the way it's set up now with a cliff, uh, you get to a certain point and then you don't want to make that step. And so I don't mind if, if and would encourage that we develop some way to allow them to have some savings, actually keep some of the money wh while they make that jump. Uh, but also, you know, we, it can't be so high that the jobs that we have available around here, they turn down. And that's what's happening right now. Um, the second thing as far as reforming welfare, you know, just a couple examples that I worked on uh, a few years ago when Republicans had the majority, uh, our EBT card that we give to welfare recipients uh, can be used in all 50 states and is used in all 50 states. And to me, it makes no sense that if you're on welfare that you can be in Hawaii or Alaska or I don't, I don't know that maybe we're giving you too many benefits if you find a way to do that. Uh, and then also when people move to Minnesota because our benefits 
benefits are better than many other states for welfare recipients, I would like to have a waiting period of, an, uh, waiting period of another 30 days before you'd even get them. Uh, therefore, basically discouraging people to move here if your goal is to get our welfare benefits. But as far as finding and keeping employees, that is, it, it, part of it is, is uh, the fact that we have an aging population and, and uh, there's less people available. Uh, and so what do we do? Um, first of all, I focus on that for the, the, the job that wants to be in rural Minnesota, we have to figure out a way that it's beneficial for them to be here. Uh, rural Minnesota has the second highest business property taxes in the whole country, second highest. And so that's why we offered tax relief to business owners if they own buildings in Minnesota because we wanted to be more competitive in rural Minnesota. So we need to look at all taxes related to businesses, uh, overall business taxes, we rank 47 seventh in the country. We've got to get better if we expect to have people that provide jobs here to have jobs. And we need to reduce regulations uh, that we have on businesses. We want the regulations to make sense, but not to penalize them. Um, as far as the workforce coming forward, with it, they need to be prepared. And so the education that they get needs to point towards a job that, that's going to be available to them. Uh, we need to fix Minsure because a lot of the self-employed people, that's what they have to buy and then rates are off the charts. Uh, and then other things that we can do is that the government can do is like the angel investment credit uh, where we cooperate with a business to actually help them to grow into an area. But finding and keeping Keeping good employees means we've, you know, often you have to pay them enough, and so the business has to be prosperous for them to want to stay there, uh, but also we shouldn't have to compete against welfare at the entry level. Okay, thank you, Paul. And now we will go back to you for question number three. Morrison County, like most of Minnesota, faces the reality of an aging population, rising health care costs, and increasing demand for government services with reduced revenue. Rather than taking the traditional approach of either taxing or cutting spending, how about a third way, innovation and service redesign? Do you have any thoughts on how the state could take the lead on revising the required services to have a better return on the investment? Well, I really like local control. And so uh, the more the state can empower the, the local gov uh, units of government to uh, fix and solve problems, the happier I'm going to be. I don't want it to be an adversarial relationship between the state and the counties and the cities. I don't think that's productive. I don't blame our local units of government. They're doing the best they can. Um, and so if we can work more towards block grants for counties to figure out stuff, I would support uh, more of that and more of those directions. Um, and as far as um, ideas that we can do, I want to say that Republicans for the first time in 40 years had the House and Senate in Minnesota where we actually worked on reform. And I was on state government and I went back and grabbed a list of all the different things that we did that weren't about reducing spending and weren't about increasing taxes. We had pay for performance bonds. We had state auditor performance review. IT consolidation, many people heard about that. That was a way to uh, make it less expensive to use the technology we have today. E-Verify, employee gain sharing where they were, uh, employees were allowed cash bonuses if they came up with good ideas. Uh, we audited CGIP, which was uh, state government health insurance because uh, some of the people that were on it shouldn't be on it anymore, dependents. They were way over the age limit and they never audited. We instructed the state to contract private companies to look at our, our fleet management and our utilities managements and where can we save money. IBM had been saving uh, other states money in different, uh, different ways. And we finally, we passed a sunset commission which said we were going to look at every agency, every board and say, are you still beneficial? And uh, we started doing that, and, and it was very productive because they each had to come to us uh, and talk about you know, whether they were still viable. Uh, I, unfortunately, when the other side took power the next year, they repealed the Sunset Commission, so we, we no longer have that. But those are some of the ways that we can actually work 
towards uh, innovation. Uh, there, it, it happens at the local level, it should happen at the state level and the federal level. And then finally, uh, we should look at reduced spending where that makes sense. We should not have light rail. That's a waste of money compared to all the other things we could do related to transit. Our, our, fed, our state budget grew in the last four years from 35 million up to 40, I'm sorry, billion, 35 billion, and now four years later it's 42 billion. So we've cut nothing. We've dramatically increased spending. We raised taxes 2 billion, and so we sh that has to be part of the conversation. Are we taxing more than we should? And then what does our spending look like? And it, it's complex. It's really all three of those things. Is it the right tax amount? Are we spending money in the right places? And where should we innovate? And, and we can do it. We show that we can do it. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Uh, Jason, your thoughts on service redesign and innovative programming? So we do have an aging workforce, um, particularly out in the rural area. But that's not a negative thing. It means we are winding up having more experience, people who have been in the jobs longer, um, people who live in the community for a longer time have more connection to their community members. They know the intricacies of the local government, the local community, the local networks. Um, and similarly to Paul, I am a firm believer in local control. I think people, when they have a better understanding of the local issues, they can solve problems better. I don't think top-down mandates from the government are always the best way to go. I think bottom-up solutions often tend to fix the problems better and more adaptive to the local response than we can from the state level. In terms of bringing the aging workforce, I think it's kind of a human resources issue. Um, I know that in state government and probably many local governments, county governments, we have a very rigid human resources system. So if somebody breaches the age of 62 or 65, we have position descriptions and job duties that tend to freeze people either into a position, you're either in or you're out. Um, my wife works at St. Cloud State University. They have an awesome program called Phase Retirement, where faculty members can work their way out of the workforce. Um, if we can look at some concepts for job sharing um, and providing older residents the ability to be able to work and continue contributing their skills, their knowledge, their experience, remain plugged into the community, and maybe not do so 40 hours a week, but look at exploring ways to go ahead and modify our workforce system to better go ahead and allow these folks to continue contributing, but not on a full-time basis. In addition, we can look at exploring technology block grants to help our communities and our local governments improve their services, improve their networks in such a way that allow our seniors better access to work in different ways and not need such physical tasks that we can use things to go ahead and better improve our service delivery. So many of these you don't require more funding to do. You just need to better design the current system and build in more flexibility. Um, and I think by working with the unions, by working with the state government agencies, the department heads, if we are willing to be flexible, we can achieve good outcomes for folks to make sure we're meeting the needs of our workforce, keeping people who want to work on the job and not losing that experience. Because in the next few years, I know I work for the Board of Water and Soil Resources, we've seen in the past two years, 90 years of experience walk out the door from retirements um, that have directly influenced me. That's a huge loss of knowledge and experience. And I have, I'm afraid that if we keep seeing this, we're going to wind up reinventing the mistakes of the past. So we need to make sure those folks are there to help us transition, understanding where we came from, and preparing the foundation for where we go in the future. Okay, thank you, Jason. And we'll go back to you now for question number four. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. We hear consistently that they are overtaxed and burdened with excessive insurance and labor law requirements. What do you feel can be done to help these small businesses succeed? Absolutely small businesses are their backbone of our labor force. And many times, so in terms of taxing, as I mentioned, um, over the past decade, living through many years of recession, state government cuts, we've gone ahead and 
reduce state funding, state local aid, which means the local governments have increased property taxes to meet that shortfall. Paul mentioned we were getting the process of restructuring that. We need to continue providing services and funding to our local governments so they don't have to max out their levy every year. They don't have to explore constantly raising property taxes. If the state is willing to pay for the services we require, we should do so. Um, what was the other question? Uh, with uh, burdened with excess taxes, and insurance, and labor law requirements. Yep. So in terms of labor law requirements, um, as you get to be a larger company, you invent this magical position called a compliance officer. So many of these labor law requirements are addressed by an individual organization or person in the organization. So as a new requirement comes out, you send this person to train and get them trained up and hey, that's great. So big businesses, they don't mind regulations. In fact, they like them. They say they don't, but it drives the smaller folks out of the marketplace. I think what we can do in terms of many of our labor regulations, we can review what's out there, make sure the regulations are still valid, still addressing a need, and then allow, um, rather than direct penalization upon first offenses, explore ways to allow folks to come into compliance in a reasonable fashion. So if somebody's not compliant, we don't have to find them right off the bat. We can go ahead and allow transition to compliance with a good faith effort. So we need to be flexible to allow those kind of opportunities. Okay, great. Thank you, Jason. Um, Paul, again, that we hear consistently that small businesses are overtaxed and burdened with excessive insurance and labor law requirements. What do you feel can be done to help these small businesses succeed? Well, thank you for the question. Um, because I'm a small business owner, I, I live and breathe this, and, uh, and uh, most of the small business owners I know would share these same values. But you know, Minnesota, as I've mentioned, is 47th worst place to set up and start a business and have a business. And we've got to get that number down. And property taxes is number two. Uh, so that will be the first thing I focus on is giving small business property tax relief. That was what was in that bill. Another thing that we did do in 2016, business owners, small and large, play, pay unemployment insurance. They pay it. And when people lose their job, they, they get the benefits. And so that account had an, an excess of dollars. <clears throat> and we said that that should go back, the excess should go back to the people that paid it. <clears throat> I was at a debate last night, and I was surprised that they called that a big business tax cut. And it was had nothing to do with being a tax cut. It was a refund of premiums that those people paid. So that was something we did to help. Um, we want to deal with the inflator. It's a, called a business inflator on, on business property taxes. Every year the, the state grabs more and more of business property taxes. It doesn't go to the local communities. It goes directly to the state. And so we want to eliminate that automatic increase in taxes that they can grab. We have to look at the endless regulations that business owners have to go through. Make it more of a one-stop direction. In other words, if they have to get permits, don't make them go to a number of agencies. Let it go through one so that it's not a constant battle of trying to do right but not even knowing if you are uh, in compliance. I mean, that's a very frustrating thing for business owners. Um, and I will say that Minnesota has to, to move in their attitude to a place of, we're in partnership with businesses. Uh, we appreciate them in Minnesota. We want to, to woo them here, not drive them out of the state, which is sometimes what we do. Big and small businesses are overregulated, and even when a bigger business can afford to get a compliance coordinator, they don't want to do that. Only if they're in the back pocket of the government, you know, the crony capitalists that get all the benefits. Those are the the big companies that I'm, my sights are targeted on. But there's a lot of other companies that, you know, we just create all these endless hoops for them to go to, and so they look: is Minnesota the place I want to be, or is another state, or another country? And and I just know 
too many people that we've lost unnecessarily. And so small business is, is who I am and it's who we are. It's rural Minnesota is all small business and we've got to create a place where they want to be, where they can grow, where they can succeed. And when they succeed, what happens? They add more people and they pay them more and it's a win for all of us. And so uh, I, I just, I'm so thankful for the businesses we have and I want them to, to know that and I want to help them be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And the next question then goes back to you. If elected, what would be different in Morrison County because of your presence in the Senate? Well, thank you. I, I, um, I feel like I'm a voice for rural Minnesota, which includes Morrison County. And in my case, I also rep represent Southwest Cass, Todd, and Wadena. And so I see things partly through a rural lens because that's who I am and who I represent. And I have built great relationships with both uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, that allow me to influence things for our area. Uh, I represent Camp Ripley and have often been able to get things for Camp Ripley up here that they needed. Uh, military pension exemption was a major piece of legislation that I've been working on for years. I'm in the minority and yet we got that bill passed and that helps a lot of our retiring veterans that will get that pension exempt. We were only one of five or six states that, that didn't give that, well now we're going to be much more competitive in recruiting those people. Uh, when we worked on the Camp Ripley Veterans Trail, uh, that was in a bonding bill and I was on the final tax committee. Well, I was doing horse trading with then DFL legislator John Ward and they needed something up in Baxter related to the airport and so we worked it out where both of those things happened because he was working on my things and, and I was working on his things. And so uh, for rural Minnesota, it just means that the needs that we have here, I'm very interested interested in and will help. Uh, just to give you another example, uh, rural nur or nursing homes and their reimbursement rates were skewed towards metro. There was a metro rate, a rural rate, and a deep rural rate. And so many of our, our nursing homes were getting deep rural reimbursement rates and metro rates were getting much higher rates. Well, we were able to change that where they all now get one rate that is slightly higher than the metro rate. So everyone got more, but our nursing homes rural and deep rural got much more and so uh, because I can build bridges uh, with people uh, it means that I can communicate the needs that we have in our area and they are actively trying to help me meet the needs of my area. Sometimes legislators have very adversarial roles with the other side and that's not productive because then what you need to get for your area they're they're not interested in helping you and what I would say is at least 90 percent of the legislation we work with is local. It's how do we help our people in our little towns and big towns and if you don't have relationships with people on the other side of the aisle, you're not going to get it done. I'm openly very conservative, both fiscally and socially. Uh, everybody knows that, but I have respect from the other side of the aisle because I respect them. And so that's how I can help this area just by you know being a good uh, communicator and a, a good legislator down there. Thank you, Paul. And Jason, what would be different if you were elected to the Senate? So as Paul mentioned, when we look at our rural legislatures, we work really well. They work really well across the aisle. So Republicans and the DFL members have real, who represent rural districts do a super job of coming and presenting a coordinated front. One of the things that I would do to St. Paul um, is realize that it's really not a dispute between the DFL and the Republican folks in the rural area. There are some folks in the metro area who don't understand what's happening out here. So there tends to be a split in the knowledge basis of what happens between the metro suburbs, the metro inner city rings, and what happens in the rural areas. So I know that when I talk to folks in the Twin Cities, I have family who lives in the Twin Cities, they have no idea what's happening out in farm, ag, and rural countries. So we need to go ahead and make the connection with the folks in the metro area to allow them to better understand what we need out here. 
We all have a tendency of living in our own little bubbles. Um, and I have the ability to span those little areas. Um, in my work area with the state, I encompass the city of St. Cloud. I encompass many of the rural areas. So I understand the language and the interests and the, and the desires and the language of the folks from urban areas. And I think I can go ahead and bring the discussion and say, hey, I respect the challenges that you folks have dealing with an inner city population or dealing with a community that's rapidly growing and the infrastructure needs. But you also need to understand what we have out here. And we can reach that common ground. It's all about building bridges. And I would make a concerted effort to go ahead and work with our metro communities to make sure that our voice is heard and they understand and have a feeling for what's happening out here. I'd also seem to try to work better with the 800-pound gorilla in the room, who's the governor. Um, Paul talked about the failing of the bonding bill and the failure of the tax bill. You know, the legislature passed those two bills and popped the cork on the champagne bottle, and everybody went home and got surprised when the governor vetoed that bill. Well, the governor has a role in state government, so we need to make sure we understand the governor's office, his position, where he's going to veto things, and we need to work to get things done in a timely fashion to overcome those veto blocks. As Paul mentioned, we had 90%, if not more, of the legislators on board with both the tax bill and the bonding bill, and had we passed that bill in a timely fashion, we probably could have overridden the governor's veto and brought that money out. So we need to work more in a timely fashion. So I'd work with our, my partners on both sides of the aisle to try to do things in a more timely fashion and get things out so we can respond to veto threats in an efficient way and get things done properly. Okay, great. Thank you, Jason. Um, and coming back to you, um, if you had your choice, what would be the top three committees you would like to serve on? Uh, higher end workforce development um, and the environment and natural resources. Those would be the top two I'd look at. Okay. Would you have a third? Um, I would have to explore some of the options. I'd okay. Great. Paul, what would your top three choices be? Well, uh, for sure, taxes and commerce, that's where I'm, I have the most expertise. Uh, and if we take the majority back, I'll probably be the tax chair. Uh, the other the third one I have now is veterans. I'd either take veterans or agriculture or environment. Uh, those three, all three of those uh, uh, affect our area. Okay. Can I actually, state government. So state workforce would be my third. Okay, great. Um, before we go into closing statements, uh, the last question I have, and it goes to Paul first. We touched on a variety of topics today. Is there anything that we did not ask you that you would like to share with the audience? Uh, yes, uh, the, because there's so many issues that we could have talked about, um, but sometimes we can't. Minsure is a crisis, and we're going to have to fix it. Uh, I've gotten emails from farmers that are their rate, their premiums are going up to over thirty thousand dollars a year, and if they only make fifty or sixty thousand. That's a crisis, and so I'm, that's something I'm very passionate about. It would take about 30 minutes to talk about where I'm coming from on that, but we can improve it without a doubt. Uh, MSHA, Minnesota Comprehensive Health Association, was what we used to have for our, our high-risk people, people that couldn't get insurance somewhere else. We found a place for them to have it. Those rates are dramatically cheaper. Our high-risk health insurance that we used to have, dramatically cheaper than Minsure rates for people that have to buy health insurance today. And the deductibles were lower, and so we can do better on that one. We need to work on religious liberty issues, even in our, in our area. People are pun punished when they don't think that marriage is between two men and, and don't want to cooperate uh, with using their business to help that. We need to have a discussion about that. That's not easy, but we need to talk about it. Uh, Pro-life, uh, we can continue to work on things. One of the things I want to do is end tax payer funded abortions. Uh, that's a big number of them. Uh, we were able to keep it off of a mandate for minsure plans, but we can do more. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll say that um, you know, uh, light rail, we, we cannot support that. Uh, the governor's doing an end run on that one. It didn't happen legislatively. We need transit, which includes buses in our area. And if we're pouring all that money down light rail, which is $100 million a mile or more to build, 
and then we still lose money even on the tickets we charge we've got to think about it a different way buses are cheaper uh, they're faster than light rail because light rail just goes across the tracks they're more flexible and uber now one of the the new technology companies actually is getting into transit let's let them do it let's use those dollars for buses and for roads and bridges Thank you, Paul. Uh, Jason, what would you like to share with the audience? So yeah, as, as Paul mentioned, there's a whole host of needs. Um, in terms of the insurance, the, the rates that are going up for small businesses and individual payers, we do need to work on that. Um, what Paul didn't mention is um, many folks on the Republican side of the aisle want to do away with the miniature system and turn it over to the federal health exchange, which I'm sure you've heard is doing remarkably well. Um, and I think part of the underlying talk there is if we turn it over to the feds, there's still a hope Obamacare will be done away with. So ab abdicating our local control and authority over miniature, we need to make sure we make the changes. We need to look at why rates are going so high for our small businesses and find ways to allow small businesses to better cope within the miniature system and get their rates to be more competitive with other folks. So we need to go ahead and work to improve insurance opportunities for small businesses and the individuals. Uh, in terms of infrastructure and transportation funding, we have tremendous needs out there. Um, and I think going ahead and working to um, fix those needs through long-term borrowing is not a sustainable solution. We wind up taxing future generations to pay for the roads and bridges we want to build and maintain today. If we're maintaining roads, we should be finding a system to go ahead and fund those roads on an annual basis in a more comprehensive fashion. I do disagree with Paul in terms of the light rail in the southwest. Uh, when you put a light rail line in, it goes ahead and allows the community to understand where those stations are going to be. I grew up in New York, and they have subways, and they have a commuter train system. And at every single commuter stop, you have a healthy, vibrant community of people who use that rail to get into the cities and do their jobs. In addition, we talked about aging workforces. We are probably also going to see senior communities de developing outside a light rail because they know those stops are going to be there. If you have buses, if you have Uber, you don't have the same kind of consistency and reliability you have for other folks. And finally, I think one thing we both, uh, Paul, missed talking about, but I think we are both in support of, is enhanced uh, internet high-speed broadband internet capability out here to the rural area. Um, we need to connect our communities, our individuals, our rural farmers with high-speed broadband internet because I know there are many of them that are still on dial-up and the way tra uh, data transfer exchange is going these days, so much of this stuff is high-speed needed data. You can't take seven hours to download a form or a process. You need to have the rural community plugged in to make sure that we're connected connected to the state, the national, and the international business community. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Paul has asked for 30 seconds. Yeah, quick follow-up on why I think we should repeal Minsure and go to the Federal Exchange. Uh, it's working at least better uh, than Minsure is, and that's why I say that. Uh, it, we didn't have to say it that way. The Minnesota Chamber of Commerce wanted a state exchange, but by the time we finished uh, and we're going to vote on it, they said, please don't vote for it. Not one Republican voted for Minsure because they didn't listen to the ideas that would have made it better. The Minsure board has nobody in the health insurance industry on it and no doctors, no hospitals for experts. How is it going to work when you don't listen to the people that know how to run it? All right, we'll finish up with our final closing statements. We'd like you to summarize your position on campaign issues. So again, um, as I stated in the opening, I'm a strong supporter of local government. I think local government can create the foundation upon which we can build our future. Um, we need to increase and provide additional support to help local government do the jobs we want. Many times we've seen state funding be cut and no requirements to cut the, the services and provisions that are required under state law. If we're going to cut a program funding, we need to explore whether or not we want to still do that program. So I'm open and willing to explore cutting programs and standing up for accountability for saying we are no longer going to do that. But we need to have that conversation rather than whittle away. So I'm running for uh, office to help our local communities attract the develop the kind of infrastructure and the needs they need to bring in small businesses and make Minnesota a place to live. 
Paul talked a little bit about some of the traditional family values issues. I think it's important to have traditional values issues, but we also need to be inclusive. Our society is changing. You know, much of the language we see today is we want to keep these people out of our system. We don't like what we're kind of seeing. And I think if we find ourselves exclusive, exclusion is going to leave the small business communities who want to come here out. If we're seen as an intolerant community, they're not going to want to be here. So we need to make sure we ha create a system where everybody's welcome, everybody has an opportunity, regardless of their family lifestyle, their religious decisions. We want to make sure that folks can come here, feel welcome, and become actively engaged with the business community, the social community, and find a place to raise their families and set down roots. Great. Thank you, Jason. And Paul, your closing statements? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to serve. Uh, and anybody that's in the legislature, as, a, as one of a Senator House members, a Republican, Democrat, it's an honor to serve. And so I, I appreciate that. I hope to have an, another four years to serve you. Um, God willing, that's what's going to happen, but we'll find out. Uh, I do want to at least talk about where Jason and I are different. Uh, these are some of the areas that you can choose, but I'm pro-life. Uh, Jason mentioned that he is pro-choice, so that's a, a big difference between us. Uh, I think that we should not fund light rail because we have other resources that we can put that money towards for transportation. Jason supports light rail. I do not support a gas tax. Uh, Jason supports a gas tax. I think that um, when we look at uh, the bathrooms and the situation with transgender boys, I don't think that transgender boys should be able to play on girls' teams. I don't think they should be in girls' showers, locker rooms, or bathrooms. Uh, I think we can find solutions. I, I know that there are school districts that have quietly found solutions, but we shouldn't force that on the girls in our, our schools. I think it's a privacy, privacy issue. We're different on that one as well. And so there's a number of areas that we're different, and then there's areas that we're the same. We both want local government to have a, a big part in uh, helping provide services to our, our people, our constituents. Um, there's other areas that we agree on too, and, and uh, we're both passionate about trying to help and trying to make a difference. And so in the end, if you like where I'm at on issues, you, you've heard about the people that endorsed me, that's a pretty good indicator where I'm going to be on those issues, then I hope that you'll consider voting for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we want to thank both Paul and Jason for being with us today. Our thank yous also go out to Mark from Great River Television for recording this for rebroadcast and to the City of Little Falls for allowing us to use the facility today. And as always, the Chamber encourages you to be an informed voter on November 8th. So thank you for being with us. And we will shut off our microphones. Or is this really? Forward. 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 Four down, two to go.